Thank you. Please, please, please be seated. Well, somebody's going to introduce us, I think. Hi everyone. I'm. I'm <laughs> no, this one's mine. Oh, I see. God, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, I'm here because I have the the pleasure and the honor of introducing our guest today, and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice. <laughs> It's an honor for me, especially because I've had such a long history of admiration for her for so long. And so to be able to be with her today and welcome her to our festival, I think she's going to enhance the quality of our festival just by being here. So I'm happy to introduce her. And, and let me just say that there are many reasons to celebrate and honor her. I would be here for a long, long time if I listed all the attributes that she had, but let me just state a couple. Um, the fact that she was born in poverty, near poverty, and rose up through the ranks from lower ladder on the, on the uh, lower rung on the ladder, so to speak, to rise up to become a woman in a world of law dominate, dominated by men, and to continue to rise so that she became a Supreme Court Justice. And to watch her and what her, her qualities are, which the fight for justice and equality are the two main things that I can think of. But I can't think of any greater honor than to be able to introduce a person I so admire. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Sorry. Um, I'm here to welcome you to Cinema Cafe. <laughs> My name is John Nine. I'm a senior programmer of the festival. Um, I'm very grateful for our guests joining us today. I wanted to just, I think this is obviously a highlight of the festival for all of us. And I say that because over the 10 days of this festival, a lot of the focus is on the films and the screening of new independent work. But I think from our point of view also, um, those films incite conversation. Uh, and we've always seen the festival as a place that is a place of dialogue, it's a place of ideas, uh, it's a place for us to process the work that we're seeing and sort of reconcile what that means for our lives and our society. So we're really, really happy to, uh, to be hosting this conversation. And I want to thank our moderator for the conversation, um, Nina Totenberg. <laughs> Nina, Nina Totenberg, who many of us know um, from her voice several times a week um, on NPR. And those select few uh, carry our things around in the Nina Toten bag. So <laughs> thank you so much, Nina. Uh, and thank you, Justice Ginsburg. Thank you all for coming. Well, I, for one, am delighted to be here with Justice Ginsburg. Um, she is perhaps the most recognizable justice on the Supreme Court, though she underweighs them all, even the women, <laughs> probably by about 40 pounds. So even before she became the second woman to serve on the nation's highest court, Ruth Ginsburg quite simply changed the way the world is for American women for more than a decade until her first judicial appointment in 1980, 
She led the fight in the courts for gender equality. When she began her legal crusade, women were treated by law differently from men. Thousands of state and federal laws treated women differently from men. They restricted what women could do, barring them from jobs, rights, even from jury duty. By the time she first put on judicial robes, however, she had worked a revolution. So let's start with what's going on in the world of women today. You were the architect of the legal fight for women's rights. Um, today the issues are both the same and different. Different is that front and center is the question of sexual harassment, how to treat various kinds of behavior, what should be a fireable offense, a lesser offense, can offenders redeem themselves, whether peers in the workplace can date, and on and on. But what I want to know first is whether when you were a younger woman, not a judge or a Supreme Court justice, were you ever subject to inappropriate behavior, and how did you handle it? The answer is yes. Every woman of my vintage knows um, what sexual harassment is, although we didn't have a name for it. But if I can just preface my remarks about sexual harassment with my first introduction to Nina Totenberg. And I think it must have been 1971 I was teaching at Rutgers Law School. Nina called me and said, I'd like to ask you a question. What has this equal protection got to do with women? I thought the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment is about race. How does it apply to women? And that's, that was our first conversation. And we have been close friends ever since. <laughs> the, the attitude to sexual harassment was simply get past it. Boys will be boys. Well, I'll give you just one example. I'm taking a chemistry course at Cornell. And my instructor said, because I was a, a uncertain about my ability in that field, he said, I'll give you a practice exam. So he gave me a practice exam. The next day on the test, the test is the practice exam and I knew exactly what he wanted in return. And that's just uh, one of many examples. This was not considered anything you could do something about, that the law could help you do something about, until a book was written by a then young woman named Kitty McKinnon, Catherine McKinnon and it was called Sexual Harassment in the Workplace. And I was asked to read it by a publisher and give my opinion on whether it was worth publishing. It was a revelation. The first part described incidents like the one I just mentioned, and the next was how this anti-discrimination law, Title VII, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, religion, and sex, how that could be used as a tool to stop sexual harassment. It was eye-opening, and it was the beginning of a field that didn't exist until then. Just to close the loop here, 
for a minute. Um, what did you do about the professor? Did you just stay clear of him? What did you do? I <laughs> went to his office and I said, how dare you, how dare you do this? And that was the end of the, the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you did quite well on that exam. <laughs> and when I deliberately made two mistakes. <laughs> oh, what is your, what are your thoughts about what women should be doing now? I I deliberately left in a lot of the questions because it is more complicated than people may think at first blush. And I wonder what you think of the Me Too movement and if you've given any thought to the strategy for women as a group. Well, I think it's about time. <laughs> um. For so long, women were silent, thinking there was nothing you could do about it. But now the law is on the side of women or men who encounter harassment, and that's a good thing. In the film industry, it turns out that a lot of women aren't being paid as well as men, or at least that their agents don't push for them to be paid as well as men. Uh, there have been a couple of times in your career, first at Rutgers Law School and then at Columbia, when you found out that you and other women, and in, in a third case, female janitors, were not being treated the same as men. Um, in two cases you sued them, in the third case you threatened to. Weren't you worried that they would fire you? Being paid the same as men. When I joined the faculty of Rutgers Law School, Rutgers is a state university, and the dean, who was a very kindly man, said, Ruth, you're going to have to take a cut in salary. And I said, I understand that. State universities don't pay so well. But when he told me how much of a cut, I was astonished. So I asked, well, how much do you pay so-and-so? A, a man who was out of law school about the same amount of time I was. And the dean replied, Ruth, he has a wife and two children to support. You have a husband with a good paying job in New York. And that was considered, that was the very year the Equal Pay Act had passed. That was the answer that I got. What the women at Rutgers did was they didn't make a big fuss. They got together and they filed an Equal Pay Act complaint, not even Title VII, just straight equal pay, and so that, that suit was filed in 1964. The university settled. The lowest increase was $6,000, which in those days was a lot more than it, than it is today. When I got to Columbia, one problem was with the, the faculty because the the university didn't give out salary figures. I was the law school's representative to the university senate, and the first thing we wanted to get was those figures. And then once we did, our case was won. The, the, the maids janitor situation is, I get to Columbia, this is, what year was it, 1972. And a feminist I knew well came to see me to tell me that Columbia had just issued 25 layoff notices 
to 25 women in the maintenance department. No layoffs for any man. And then she said to me, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so I went to the university vice president for business and told him that the university was violating Title VII. And he said, Professor Ginsburg, Columbia has excellent Wall Street lawyers representing them. And would you like a cup of tea? Well, that was on a Monday. <laughs> um, there was an application to stop Columbia immediately to get a temporary injunction. There was a meeting at Columbia with feminists. At that meeting, Bella Absick was there, Gloria Steinem was there, Susan Sontag was there. I think that so impressed the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that they sent their chief counsel to argue in favor of the temporary injunction. We get to court on Monday morning. The union, one of Columbia's excuses was the union wanted to have separate seniority lines so that we had janitors and maids. And no janitor would be let go until all the maids were gone. So Columbia said, if the union insisted on that in, in our contract, the union representative got up in court and said, we can't abide by a contract that violates Title VII. So the union came over <laughs> on the side of the maids. And Columbia was there all uh, alone. Okay. And of course, they, there was a temporary injunction. But the most heartening thing about it was the, the women who, who were categorized as maids. These were women who really didn't care that they were paid less. They expected that. But they wanted jobs. They didn't want to be on welfare. In the course of that litigation, those women grew in self-esteem. And two of them ended up being shop stewards. That, and that was the most heartening part of the maids janitor controversy. When Columbia lost um, and the preliminary injunction was issued, Columbia decided, well, they really didn't have to lay off anyone. They could take care of the excess numbers by attrition, by not hiring a replacement for someone who left. So when they were faced with the necessity of having to drop about 10 men before they reached the first woman, they found a way to avoid laying off anyone. Were, weren't they? You know, there's no doubt in all of these uh, situations who is the backbone of the opposition, the legal backbone. It's you. So how come they didn't fire you? My troops at the law school were hugely supportive. And I think the university knew I was untouchable for that reason. Whatever I did, the faculty was behind me, even if they disagreed. And the, the one time we had a serious disagreement was in the, uh, the pension case. So in those days, when women retired, they got less than men per month. Because they lived longer. Right. So they were actuarially equal. Well, the whole idea of Title VII is you don't lump categorized people. And it's true that on average, women live more than, live longer than men. But there are some women who die young and some men who live past 100. So how did they treat, were they mad or at you over that? Yes, they were concerned <laughs> that, <laughs> that they would get less per month than they would otherwise when they retired. <laughs> so, do you ever worry with the Me Too movement about a backlash against women? 
let's see where it goes. So far, it's been great. Yes, and there, there was a book, what, what was her name? The one who wrote the book called Backlash. Faludi. Faludi, yes. <laughs> yeah. But when I see women appearing every place in numbers, I'm less worried about backlash than I might have been 20 years ago. So we're here at Sundance, a center of one form of the arts. So let me ask you, do you remember the, the first movie that you really loved? And if there's some movie in the last few years that you really loved? Well, the first movie, that's an easy question. It was Gone with the Wind. <laughs> I don't know whether I would have loved it if I saw it today, but I saw it at least five times. <laughs> um, what about now? It's, it's hard to pick out one film. Of course, the, well, I'll just say the most, two most recent film I saw. I don't get a chance to go to the movies very often. <laughs> but one was uh, three bi three bi billboards. <laughs> a fantastic film. And the other was uh, Call Me by Your Name, which is a beautiful, beautiful film. I have to find out where in Italy it took place. <laughs> Some people here may not know about your devotion to other art forms like the opera. Uh, you once told me if you could be anything in the world, you would have been an operatic diva. <laughs> so why weren't you? Because I'm a monotone. <laughs> <laughs> but in my dreams, that, that's a recurring dream, is I'm on stage at the Metropolitan Opera. <laughs> and I'm about to sing Tosca. <laughs> And then I remember that I am a monotone. <laughs> what is it about opera and music in general that has so um, captivated you that on any given night in Washington, at least once or twice a week, I would guess, you're at the opera or the symphony or some other musical performance? Most recently, on Wednesday night of this, this week, I was at the dress rehearsal of a new opera uh, called Proving Up. Um, I was turned on to opera when I was 11 years old. I was a grade school kid in Brooklyn, and my aunt took me to a children's performance of a most unlikely choice for a first opera. It was La Gioconda. These were operas condensed to one hour. There were costumes, there was bare staging, and there was a narrator who was also the conductor of an all children's orchestra. That man's name was Dean Dixon. The year was 1944. Dean Dixon left the United States at the end of the 40s and commented that for all the time he'd been conducting, no one had ever called him maestro. Why? Because he was African American. So he went off to Europe and he was the darling of every major orchestra there. He married well, and some 20 years later, he came back to the United States at the end of the 60s just to visit. And every major symphony orchestra in the country wanted him to be a guest conductor. And that illustrates for me the enormous change in our country from the middle 40s to the late 60s. 
Anyway, I got hooked on opera at age 11. I began to attend the rehearsals at the city center in New York. What does it do for you? What does music do for you? Uh, what does it do? What does beautiful music do? It, it takes me out of my immediate uh, concerns, out of worrying about how I'm going to write this opinion so that it will be understood by the audience. It is enchanting. I, I tend to listen to the music, um, both in chambers, either a CD or the one classical station we have in, in DC. Sometimes I have to turn it off because I have to think really, really hard and can't have any distractions. You know, um if you walk into the justices' chambers, I think any of you in this room would be quite surprised. Uh, Supreme Court justices are allowed to have artwork from the National Gallery, anything that they want that's not on the walls of the National Gallery. So they can say, I'd like this or that, and it's loaned to them until the, until the, the National Gallery may need it for an exhibition or something like that. And most of the artwork is on the is what is fairly traditional artwork. You walk into her chambers, and it's all extremely modern artwork. Um, what is it you love about modern art? Well, first, I should my my colleague's taste runs in two directions. One is portraits, portraits of long dead men. <laughs> <laughs> and the other is out, outdoor scenes. <laughs> it's, it's not just the National Gallery. I have two paintings from the National Gallery. I have five from the Museum of American Art. And I was allowed to go downstairs at the gallery to see the huge collection of Mark Rothko's they have. Now, you would not recognize my paintings as... Mark Rothko's because he changed his style so very much. The five that I have from the Museum of American Art come from something called the Frost Collection. It's a collection of United States painters in the WPA period, roughly from 1933 to 1945. And so I have five of, of those, and I have one from the Hirshhorn. Um, the film that's being premiered here today about you, uh, I thought I'd ask you about a little bit. Now, neither of us has seen it. <clears throat> so there's, and you don't want to talk about it because you haven't seen it. So I thought I'd ask you about the process of being followed around by cameras for a while. You're used to public appearances and even public interviews, but how was that, and, and did you dress any differently? Did I dress for the camera? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think Betsy and Julie wanted me to be just as I am. Well, you'll see in, in the film, as Nina told you, we, neither of us has seen it yet, but I have great expectations. <laughs> I know the film crew played for you a video of your own self being portrayed on Saturday Night Live, <laughs> and your children told them that you had not ever seen it. Uh, so what did you think of your portrayal on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> I liked the, the actress who portrayed me. I think what is it? Kate McKinnon? Yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. And I would like to say Ginsburg <laughs> <laughs> sometimes <laughs> to my colleagues. 
You know, this brings something up. At age 84, you're going strong. As you can see, everybody, she hasn't dropped a stitch. And every liberal in America is prepared to throw their bodies in front of, uh, in front of you to protect you. <laughs> You are a rock star. There are songs about you, T-shirts, mugs. You're now known simply as the notorious RBG. Um, this must be fun for you, but how do you suppose your colleagues feel? Uh, my colleagues are judiciously silent about <laughs> the notorious RBG. Um, so let me go back to when you weren't a rock star and you were at Cornell uh, in undergraduate school. Um, and uh, you met your hu the man who would be your husband, Marty Ginsburg. Um, now, back then, men far, far outnumbered women at Cornell. So what was it about Marty that struck your fancy? First, men outnumbering women. There were four men to every woman at Cornell in those days. So it was the ideal school for the parents of daughters. <laughs> because if you couldn't get your man at Cornell, you were hopeless. <laughs> well, the remarkable thing about Marty, to whom I was married for 56 years, is he cared that I had a brain. No guy up until then was the least interested in how I thought. So Marty was a revelation to me. And throughout my life, well, I certainly wouldn't be here today were it not for Marty because he made me feel that I was better than, than I thought I was. When I went to law school, um, I was concerned in those first few weeks whether I would make it. Marty was telling, he was a year ahead of me, he was telling all of his buddies, my wife will be on the law review. <laughs> well, that's just how he was. He had a great sense of humor. And another a very important strength, he was a wonderful cook. <laughs> and he said that he owed his skill in the kitchen to two women, at first his mother and then his wife. <clears throat> I thought he gave his mother a bum rap, <laughs> but he was certainly right about me. <laughs> and now there is at the Supreme Court gift shop a book called Supreme Chef, that supreme chef is Marty Ginsburg. The spouses of my colleagues, when Marty died, thought that the best tribute they could have to, to him would be a collection of his recipes. So Marty Ginsburg was a great gourmet chef. He wasn't just a great chef. I mean, he really was stupendous. And um, at the same time that he was one of the country's leading tax experts and one of the funniest men alive. So, uh, but you went to Harvard Law School together. He was a year ahead of you, and you were just one of nine women in a class of over 500. You were on Law Review. You had a 14-month-old daughter. And then Marty was diagnosed with testicular cancer. The doctors threw the book at him, what they had at the time, which was massive radiation. And he was first, pretty sick. First, the surgery, massive surgery first. Massive surgery and radiation, and he was pretty sick. How did you manage to get through that time? What was the routine that you established for yourself? How I got through that time was mainly his classmates and mine. Harvard Law School was supposed to be fiercely competitive. 
our experience was quite different. My classmates, his classmates, rallied around us and helped us get through that very difficult time. Marty's routine with radiation, it was massive radiation. There was no such thing as chemotherapy then. So he'd get the radiation, come home, be terribly sick, fall asleep, and get up about midnight. I had between midnight and two when he went back to sleep to whatever he was going to ingest that day, he would eat between those hours. So my routine was I went to my classes. I had note takers in all of his classes. I went to Mass General when he was at the hospital. And I came home, fed my daughter, and she went to sleep. And I studied what I could could for that time. Marty would get up. He would have some uh, not very spectacular hamburger that I made. And then I would go back to the books again. So I learned to get by on very little sleep. Two hours a night it was about it. That's what our routine was like. And I, I must say that and Marty attended two weeks of classes that semester. He got the highest grades he ever got. He was very close to the top in the class. And that was because he had the best tutors in the world, his classmates, who took notes and then came to the hospital and later home to give him tutorials. Um, so when he graduated, you, he got a good job in New York. You moved to New York. You went to Columbia for your last year. You graduated tied for first in your class there. Um, but, uh, and you had lots of recommendations for clerkships, but most judges wouldn't even interview you. Indeed, even Supreme Court justices wouldn't interview you. So um, tell, tell the story of how, tell, how did you get, finally get a clerkship? I had a, a teacher at Columbia Law School, uh, Gerald Gunther, who later moved to Stanford. He was in charge of getting clerkships for Columbia Law students, and he was determined to get a clerkship for me. He concentrated on one judge in the Southern District of New York, a trial court judge, who was a graduate of Columbia College and Columbia Law School and took all of his clerks from Columbia. When Jerry proposed me, the judge was hesitant. He, had, he said he had a woman law clerk, and she was fine. He had one. But I had a then four-year-old child, and so he was concerned that I couldn't do the job. I couldn't be there when he needed me because I would be taking care of my child if she were sick. Or, so the professor made an offer to the judge. He said, if you give her a chance, I have arranged for, for a young man in her class who is going to a Wall Street firm. If she doesn't work out, he'll jump in and take over. That was the carrot. And then there was a stick. And the stick was, if you don't give her a chance, I will never recommend another Columbia student to you. Now this is a story I never knew about. I thought the judge had hired me because he had two daughters and he was thinking how he would like the world to be for them. It wasn't until Jerry wrote a, a comment in the Hawaii Law Journal telling the story that I, 
I knew how I got that first job. That was the challenge for women of my era. Getting your foot in the door, getting that first job. Once you got the job, you did it at least as well, in many cases better than the men. But it was the first job that was powerfully hard to get. So tell the story about how you used to ride in the car with your judge. And another judge, the very famous learned hand, who had refused to hire you, um, was in the car also. Um, learned hand was one of the greatest federal judges of all time. He was a brilliant man. My judge lived around the corner from Judge Han and would dri drive him when Han became an octogenarian. Judge Palmieri, my judge, would drive him to the courthouse and then back at the end of the day. And when I finished my work on time, I sat in the back of the, the car as they drove uptown. And I would hear this great man, learned hand, say whatever came into his head, <laughs> sing um, saucy songs, <laughs> salty <laughs> songs. Um, and I said to him, you won't hire me as a clerk, but yet you say in this car, you don't inhibit your speech at all. You have said words that my mother never taught me. <laughs> and he said, a young lady, I am not looking at you. Uh, uh, men of that age um, were told, don't do inhibit your speech when you're talking to women. And you were in the back seat. Yes. So he wasn't looking at right. you. So you weren't there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I will leave to the movie the sort of sto story of your professional career because we're getting low on time. But um, eventually you founded the ACLU Women's Project at the same time you were teaching at Columbia and litigating cases all over the country and arguing cases in the Supreme Court. Uh, you had two children, and there's a story I often get you to tell young women who are struggling with so-called um, life balance issues. It's a story about your son James in school. My son James, who is now a, a really fine human, and, and makes the best classical CDs in the world. Cedilla um, Records. Yes. Cedilla Records. It's a, a, a Chicago, what is it? Cla Chicago Classical Recording Foundation. Um, this child was what his teachers called hyperactive, and I called lively. So I would get called by the head of the school or the school psychologist or the room teacher to come down immediately to hear about my son's latest escapade. Well, one day, I think I'd been up all night writing a brief. I was at my office at Columbia Law School. I got the call and I responded. This child has two parents. Please alternate calls. <laughs> and it's his father's turn. <laughs> so um, my husband, Marty, went down to the school. It was confronted by three stone faces, the principal, the room teacher, the psychologist. And he was told. Your son stole the elevator. It was one of those handheld elevators. The, the 
elevator operator had gone out for a smoke, <laughs> and one of my son's classmates dared him to take the kindergartners up to the top floor in the elevator. <laughs> so Marty's response when he was told of this grave infraction on my son's part, Marty's response was, he stole the elevator. How far could he take it? <laughs> well, I don't know if it was Marty's sense of humor. I suspect it was that the school was, was reluctant to take a man away from his work. I wouldn't hesitate to call a mother away from hers. Anyway, there was no quick change in my son's behavior. But the calls came barely once a semester. And the reason was they had to think long and hard before asking a man to take time out of his work day to come to the school. You know, uh, one of your great friends on the court was Justice Scalia, with whom you disagreed a great deal. Um, but you were also very close friends. And people often find it hard to understand that, how it was that this sort of, the symbol of um, so-called originalism or textualism or conservatism on the Supreme Court, and you were such close friends. Um, so what was it about him that made you such close friends? I mean, he said of you, what's not to like? Um, but what was it that you loved about him? And you did love him in many ways. In number one, his sense of humor. The first time I heard it was then Professor Scalia speak, it was at some lawyers' convention in Washington, D.C. I disagreed with a good deal of what he said, but I was captivated by the way, the way he said it. When we were buddies on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, the only three judges, and Nino would lean over and say something that absolutely cracked me up. And I had all I could do to avoid bursting out with laughter. So often I pinched myself very hard. <laughs> and so he, he has a great sense of humor. We both really care about families. And we share a love of beautiful music, especially opera. You describe uh, one of your opinions that, that you'll hear more about in the film, the VMI case, but, and your interaction with him, because he dissented. Um, I think he was the sole dissenter. Yes. And um, d describe that. He was the sole dissenter, I should say, because Justice Thomas's son at the time was attending VMI, so he didn't sit on the case. So Nino ended up being the sole dissenter. I had circulated my opinion. I think we have somebody here who knows a little bit about it who will confirm. I think it was early in April when we circulated the opinion, and we were waiting on the dissent. It was time for me to go to my circuit judicial conference at Lake George. And Justice Scalia comes into my chambers, throws down a sheet of paper on my desk, and said, Ruth, this is the penultimate draft of my VMI dissent. I'm not quite ready to circulate, but I want to give you as much time as I can to answer it. So I took this draft on the plane with me to Albany. The conference was in Lake George. He absolutely ruined my weekend. <laughs> but I was glad to have the extra days to answer him. I think we must have gone through about 
15, 16 drafts. It was a ping pong game. Scalia would say such things as, I refer to the University of Virginia that finally admitted women in 1970-71. And I referred to, to the school as the University of Virginia at Charlottesville. He came back with, there is no University of Virginia at Charlottesville. There is just the University of Virginia. And then explain in not quite these words that a kid from Brooklyn would understandably make such a mistake because she knew about uh, the city university um, uh, at New York, at Buffalo. Um, anyway, in the end, in that debate, I certainly proved right, didn't I? Because VMI <laughs> is thriving today. It is. So, there are always new books coming out about you. Uh, one of them is about your 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 train your physical routine, which your husband Marty, when after your bout with colon cancer, told you you were <laughs> told you you were a wreck, and so that you needed a trainer. So you got this guy. You can tell about wow. the guy, and I'll show the, I will show the book, um, which is uh, R the RBG workout, which I'm told you can get across the street. Um, and you tell about Bryant Johnson, who's been your trainer for, I guess, over about? Since 1999. Yeah. So, so it, it was at the end of this bout with colorectal cancer, I was in pretty sad shape. Uh, Marty said I looked like a survivor of Auschwitz and I had to do something to build myself up. So I asked around and the district judge, Gladys Kessler, told me that there was this guy who was working in the clerk's office who was a wonderful personal trainer. That was Bryant Johnson. And we have been uh, together. We meet twice a week in the... the space reserved for, for the justices downstairs. And I tend to be compulsive about my work, but when it comes time for me to meet Bryant, whatever I'm doing, I drop it. And when you see this routine, there are a lot of young reporters in their 30s who have thought, oh, I can do this easily. And they, they end up exhausted. So, <laughs> Um, the, and the other latest book is the child's version of, or the children's, young adults' versions of the notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So uh, she's not allowed to, it would be inappropriate for her to promote books by other people, but I figured I could do it. <laughs> um, well, you have hired a full complement of clerks up through the 2020 term. <laughs> that means tw the 2020 term begins in the fall of 2020 and ends uh, in June of 2021. Uh, how's your health? It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, I, I've had, when I was asked, well, isn't it time for you to go? My first answer was, Justice Brandeis, uh, Louis D. Brandeis was appointed to the court the same age I was. He was 60. And he stepped down at age 83. I expect to stay just as long. Well, now I'm there almost two years Longer than Justice Brandeis. The next excuse was <laughs> the, the Museum of American Art has taken away my Joseph Albers, a painter I love. I couldn't think of leaving until I get my Albers back. <laughs> now I have my Albers back. So 
my current answer, the answer that will continue to be my answer. As long as I can do the job full steam, I will be here. So, I, I urge you all to see the movie here, and if you can't get in to see the movie here, to see it when it's in theaters or on CNN. And um, I have known Ruth Bader Ginsburg for well over 40 years, and um, the person you see here is very dignified, and you, as you can tell, she is also a, has a great sense of humor, but what you may not know about her is that she's a great human being. And so when my late husband died and I started to date the doctor I am now married to, I remember walking down the hall one day with Justice Ginsburg at something she'd scooped me up to take me to. And I said, Ruth, I've started to date a doctor in Boston. And in my mind's eye, I remember her head spinning around. <laughs> and what she said was, details. I want all the details. <laughs> so thank you, Justice Ginsburg. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, could you please remain in your seats while our guests exit the building? Please remain in your seats.